Hello everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today. We are going to be dissecting the top five edgiest slash scariest slash most taboo kinks. And the reason why I want to do this is because when you are new to BDSM and you start making social media accounts for kink and you go on FetLife, there's one thing you are very likely to run into. Usually towards the very top or very bottom of somebody's profile, they will have a little blurb about their hard limits. And it'll typically say something like this. My hard limits are all of the obvious ones. Parentheses, no diapers no knives, no blood, no vomit, no scat, no electricity, etc. And when you don't know anything else about kink, you don't really have a frame of reference for what is typical in the kink community yet, it's very likely that you will look at that and go, oh, okay, and I see this over and over again, that must mean that I need to have these as hard limits if I will be a safe, sane, and consensual player or come across that way to other people. So this isn't always necessarily a bad thing because when you are brand new, we don't really know what you want yet, I would say it is better to be cautious and say more is a hard limit versus less. But at the same time, I think the things that we inform ourselves about and the opinions we have towards the beginning of our kink journey, that can be sticky for a lot of people. And that can mean that we can look at something like, oh, blood is a hard limit and just like never revisit it if we don't like have a convenient opportunity to. So we might be missing out on really amazing kink experiences for us because we were told five years ago that like blood is an obvious hard limit and only the most extreme of the extreme ever engage in it when that might not necessarily be true. So what I wanna do here today is I wanna go through the top five most taboo and edgiest kinks, talk about why they are so edgy to so many people, why people who are into those kinks are into them, and also maybe give you some beginner ideas if you decide you want to explore these more taboo areas in a safer and more contained way versus like just, you know, getting a bunch of needles from Amazon and going to town. Don't do that, just spoiler alert for this video, that's probably a bad idea. So with that being said, let's get started with the list. Number one is, as I've already heavily alluded to, blood play slash sharps, AKA scalpels and needles. And I think I honestly couldn't start this list anywhere else because I, I can't think of another kink that is so divisive for people. It is something that either a lot of people love or they hate it. There are people who literally cannot be around blood, either because of just a natural physiological response to the sight of blood that they can't help but have, or they just find it very repulsive and disgusting. They're afraid of it because they're afraid of like scarring or disease, or just like it's kind of gross and off-putting for a reason they can't really name. And then for people who love it, like, they love it, okay? Like, <laughs> blood play tops, they tend to just be blood play tops. Like, it's like their kink, you know? So clearly, people have very strong opinions about this kink. And as I was saying, I think it's very natural for people to have apprehension around this kink because it is so intense and it is so risky. It's hard to know how to do well. And also because, again, a lot of us have physiological responses to it or mentally it's very, very hard to get over. It just, it's this very, it's like a biohazard, you know? Like it's like, oh, I just, well, I mean, it is a biohazard, but that being in your brain that way, it can be very hard to turn off that fear to get to a point where you can learn how to engage in it or with it in a way that maybe feels safer or feels like something that is worth exploring. But for people that love it, I think if I had to explain it to somebody that didn't get it, as somebody who enjoys blood play myself, I would say it's something that is very, it's very raw, it's very emotional, it's very, very deeply connected because blood is your life force. It is something that is so innate to being human and 
universal and connective and not to throw this buzzword around, but it is, it's primal. Like it, it's very, it's just, it's a very deep mental experience for a lot of people. And because of that, a lot of people also use it in more ritualistic or spiritual forms of doing kink. It is oftentimes associated with things like marking anniversaries or big life events. It also offers for just pure masochists, a lot of blood play is very, very deeply cathartic too. It can give you a crazy adrenaline rush like no other kink out there I can think of if you're doing it correctly. If you're doing it, it doesn't have to just be like this deep emotional experience. It can also be masochistic. It can be something that you do for artistic expression. A lot of people like doing blood play, especially with needles or with scalpels as a way of creating decorative art on somebody's body. I've seen many, many photos online of people doing all kinds of things with needles, like human harps and angel wings. And like that can seem kind of gross and almost sort of like Hannibal-esque, but for a lot of people, it's also beautiful. Like I've uh, years ago now I went to a torture garden party and there was somebody who did like blood performance art like it's clearly a very meaningful thing outside of just the intensity of it as well but if you're somebody who's not into it because it just seems like super risky I'm not gonna discount that blood play is a very risky activity I would not recommend a beginner just like like I said you know go on Amazon or Walmart or whatever and like get a bunch of needles and just like go at it like I don't recommend that I recommend going to classes but if you are doing it in a way that is medically informed, following best practices, you're getting everything tested, you're keeping everything as clean and or sterile as necessary to do that in the safest way possible, it can be something that is enjoyable and I think risky on a level that is not dissimilar to other extremely common kinks that people don't really think twice about, like bondage or rough body play. Very few kinks are totally without risk, but even with blood play, you can start to make it a little bit safer, though not completely safe, depending on what methods you're using. Obviously as well, if you're somebody who has a history of SH, for example, this probably isn't a kink I would go out and just like willy nilly explore either. I do have another video where I've talked about SH and masochism before that I think is definitely worth a watch. If you haven't seen it, I think you can go on a path where this becomes a meaningful, connective, positive thing for you and for your relationships. But I don't know you, I don't know your mental health journey, so I can't really make any concrete comprehensive recommendations on that basis. But if you do want to start exploring blood play, you don't even really have to start with blood. Again, I would always recommend taking classes, but if you wanna know what blood feels like, if you wanna know what that sensation of giving that up to your partner would feel like, like it's Halloween season, baby, go get some fake blood, right? Like get a prop knife, get some fake blood. You can do a whole scene using that. You can have juice or like wine that you color to be really, really dark that's naturally dark, like cranberry juice. And you can make it seem like your partner is drinking your blood out of like a very decorative goblet. And like you can play with the idea of blood without it necessarily actually being blood. And I have seen people have many very successful, very mentally intense scenes that way. So even blood is something you can explore in a safer way. I would say even as a beginner, maybe not for a first scene, but somewhere along the line as you're exploring the entire kink alphabet, it is something that you can add on to your experiences. And number two on this list was actually really surprising for me. This would be electro play. I had no idea so many people thought that electro play was a very intense kink and they had it as a hard limit. And for a lot of people, the reason why they don't enjoy electro play or the idea of it is they have negative childhood experiences linked to electro play. Like I even have some myself, not from childhood, but when I was a young adult, I had just gone to college, I accidentally shocked myself with an outlet in a cabin. <laughs> and like that definitely affected me. And as somebody that has tried very hard to enjoy electro play unsuccessfully over the years, I can relate to how mentally intense those experiences can be even 
a very long time afterwards, like to this day, I really struggle with devices that are more like violet wands or to zappers that are really like light and sparky and more on the surface of the skin. For some reason, I, I know consciously those devices are like not dangerous in the way they're being used by an expert on me, it's even just like a demo. But for some reason in my brain, I just can't handle it. My brain just goes, no, we're not sorry. This is dangerous. We're definitely something bad's gonna happen, like abort mission, okay? <laughs> and I have to respect my brain and my body when it's telling me and go, okay, we're not gonna push it. And with any kink on this list or otherwise, if something doesn't feel right to you, if your body, your brain is screaming, no, stop this. Do not push yourself to do it because you think you have to because, well, but everybody does this kink or my partner spent so much time making the scene for me. Like, it's okay. You don't have to do this kink. It's all right, I promise. I know I definitely felt for a long time like kind of a failure as a sub because I knew people that loved electro play where it's like, it was no big deal. Their first night ever going to a party, they would try out the violet wand and they loved it. And like mentally my brain just couldn't go there. So that being said, yes, electro play can be something that a lot of people have a lot of fear over because like, you know, electricity in general, very dangerous for the human body if not handled properly. But for people that do enjoy, I think it offers sort of this interesting sort of halfway point between like sort of sterile, like medical play type kinks and more traditional pain play. So it can be very painful and very sadomasochistic. Also devices like violet wands, most of them you can really dial in and get very exact with them. So it's a really easy way to have a scene where you know you're gonna be on level 16 out of 100. You know what to expect this time, the next time with the same device on the same setting. You can't have a more consistent experience with play that way. And it's a device that also is very showy and it has a lot of party appeal to it because of the noise and the colors it creates as well. And also mentally role play wise, a lot of people enjoy kind of like the nerdy evil scientist vibe. It kind of gives you like, I gotta be honest, every electro play top that I know is a huge nerd. Or if you're somebody that doesn't really have a lot of upper body strength, maybe you have limitations to your mobility, electro play, especially with a device like a violet wand, is a really easy way to deliver an intense scene to somebody without having to like break your back doing a two hour long flogging or having to get out the really big heavy paddle. Like it does the work for you, which can be quite convenient. Also, there are so many different devices. I've talked a lot about Violet Wands, but there's like tens units, there's to zappers, there's other standalone units that only really have maybe one or two settings. I personally prefer tens units, which have more of a muscly contraction feeling to them. I don't love them or like try to use them very often during scenes, but when they do happen, they can be quite fun. And if you do want to experiment with electro play, I would probably recommend something like a to zapper. You can get cheap violet wands from places like Wish. I don't trust them. I don't recommend them. I, if you want one of those, I'd recommend going to a full on regular retailer that you can trust for those devices. I just, I feel like cheaping out on a device like this is really not worth it. So I recommend something that's more like standalone, battery operated, much, much cheaper, like a Dazapper. You can get them for relatively cheap. And they are, they're bark and bite, but they're definitely a lot of bark. They have the the visual effect to them, the sound of them actually more than anything else with the Tazapper specifically. And so you get that more sensory experience with it, but even though it's very loud, it's not necessarily very painful either. So I think it's like a good general cheaper intro toy if you do want to experiment with it. So electro play, it can be scary, but also very rewarding. And I did just mention medical play and number three on our list is also medical play, especially more extreme medical play, like staples and sutures and just anything involving a speculum, which maybe that's me, we'll talk about that, but a lot of people don't like it because again, that coldness, that distance, 
maybe they have negative experiences either recently or from childhood involving like a doctor or a dentist where that didn't feel positive and like there's no positive mental associations there whatsoever also it's kind of gross right like a lot of medical stuff is kind of gross and like some people love the doctor tv shows where they like they show you plastic surgery happening or operating on like an animal at the zoo and like Personally for me and many other people, we find those viscerally disgusting and it's kind of hard to get past that. So even like medical devices, even though, you know, you're not going to have your abdomen cut open and your guts pulled out, like even the things that are associated with that happening can also be very off-putting and disgusting. But like with many other kinks, even though some people have a negative experience with things associated with that kink and so therefore they don't want to go anywhere near that kink for other people they run towards it for that very reason a lot of people that maybe have medical trauma or chronic pain or things like that where they're constantly going to the doctor or have negative experiences with doctors or dentists they like medical play because it's a way of like recapturing that experience and having power over it again like many other kinks it's a relatable thing here and also because sometimes the things we find gross and off-putting are also turn-ons and kind of hot and like i remember years ago before i was even in the kink community back when we were in like the sporking of twilight and 50 shades days i remember I remember somebody telling me about a line from a sporking blog that was making fun of Fifty Shades where they talked about how they had a dentist that didn't use enough Novocaine during a procedure and they were like, thank you for decades of wonderful memories for me to revisit whenever I want to because they had like a really intense like medical thing. And so this was a way for them to experience something that they found very hot and was a big turn on so it can be a turn on it can be very arousing especially the juxtaposition between what we normally associate with intimacy and like this very cold and sterile environment and also like with electroplay it can also be silly and fun right like you can have a doctor's office it's like very serious and gruff and like you've got a nurse taking notes and a doctor barking orders but it can also be lighthearted and fun right like if you're a little you know, maybe you're going to the dentist, the doctor for a checkup and like they're wearing like a colorful outfit and they're super friendly and they give you a treat afterwards or candy. You get to go to the treasure box and pick out a little toy for yourself and like they, you know, just, just praise kink you basically is instead of like doing anything really intense they're like oh you're such a good girl you're doing such a good job you're such a good little boy for being able to sit there and be so patient oh it's only gonna take a minute and oh listen to your heartbeat and like that can be a way of revisiting maybe negative past experiences or having just that experience at all for the first time and having it be joyful and positive and productive of course there's also many overlaps with things like pet play as well and like veterinary play that's another big kink that a lot of people are into so it can be fun and lighthearted. it can be jovial and also it can be serious and gruff too it totally goes across the whole spectrum and if you are somebody who wants to explore medical play and what that feels like I would maybe start out with something like a nurse costume right or a doctor costume just trying on the role play outfits for size or maybe incorporating elements or tools from medical play scenes into your other forms of play like if you have a partner who's really into being exposed maybe a speculum is an interesting way to go with that and try to like maybe take that in an even more extreme direction for the first time or maybe if you're into more of like the personal and up close stuff like i am you can try something like just you know putting on some medical gloves and maybe doing some probing around maybe feeling somebody up maybe inserting yourself into them with your gloved hands or exploring inside their mouth that can feel very invasive and medical but i think also it's maybe more compatible 
with other scene types to where you don't have to only do medical play to be able to experience the flavor of that. Like even as somebody that does not really enjoy medical play, the idea of like having somebody probe in my mouth, like, okay, that kind of makes sense with my own kinks. And really with anything in here, it's about finding the overlaps between your existing kinks and the new things you want to explore and meeting in the middle and experimenting with that middle place. But moving on, let's talk about water sports. And I don't mean jet skis when I talk about water sports here. This is one of those like all time classic hard limits. When I was getting into the scene, I swear, everyone's profile I saw for the first like year I was in the kink scene, everybody said, Water sports is a hard limit. I, I very rarely met somebody that did not have this as a hard limit to the point where I just like, I didn't know anyone who did it in real life. And then being into pet play, I started to explore more on my own. We'll talk about that. But with water sports, again, I think it's very similar to blood in the reasons why people are turned off by it because it is a bodily fluid. It does have that fear of like disease and contamination, that natural gross out factor of like, oh, we're not meant to enjoy that. We're not meant to play with that. That's a dirty thing that's meant to be over here on the sidelines, ignored, dealt with privately as privately as possible. And so to have it be something that is more public and viewable, something you do with your partner, that flies in the face of a lot of our social conditioning, depending on how and where you were raised. But once again, like many of the other kinks on this list, for the very reason why a lot of people are disgusted by it, it's the very same reason why a lot of people are into it. The fact that it is gross and taboo and not meant to be enjoyed, it is meant to be cast off over here and ignored, a lot of people are into that. They like how degrading and humiliating it is to be forced to interact with this bodily fluid, be forced to sit in it or be forced to drink it or worship it or whatever else it happens to be. They like how mentally intense it is to experience a level of humiliation. And, you know, I'm not going to be out here saying that, you know, it's completely sterile, you don't have to worry about it, it's totally fine. But I think it's maybe not quite so physically risky so much as it is mentally intense. And I do think that water sports are something you have to be cautious about engaging in because I think it it's a much more sensory thing that I think a lot of people initially plan for. Like you kind of are consciously aware of like, okay, what's gonna have this smell, it's gonna taste like this, it's gonna, like you understand all of those factors. But it's one thing to theorize it before it actually happens, another thing to actually experience it happening. So be prepared for all of the sights and sounds and smells and other sensory things that go along with engaging in water sports. But if you do do that, I think it can be something that is enjoyable to play with. And if you do want to try engaging in water sports, I would probably start with something like, and I'm probably gonna pronounce this kink wrong, so please forgive me, but I think it's called omarashi. I think it's omo, omorashi. It's a, it's a Japanese term. And essentially what that means is it is about the humiliation that is associated with having to hold in your pee for a period of time and not being able to release it and the desperation that comes with like trying to find a place to relieve it and like the embarrassment if you aren't able to do that successfully. I think playing with a more basic version of that can be an enjoyable kink, especially for people that are more power exchange oriented, where, hey, maybe you set it up to where for a day, as the submissive, you have to ask your partner for permission before you go to the bathroom. As a pet player, you have to use puppy pads for a day or something, and your partner watches you while you do it. Like, you can set it up to where, okay, like, I'm no longer currently in control of this particular bodily function, I'm giving it up to my partner, and just like seeing how that feels, like you're not really being forced to interact with it, like super viscerally in a way where your whole senses are engaged with it in the way that it would be if you were like drinking it. But it can be a good way to introduce the concept of maybe moving closer towards that and just like see how it feels to have your partner have that level of control 
over your bodily functions because I think that's like one of the things that is very appealing for people that engage in water sports having their partner control something that is like so basic for so many people so mundane so routine where you don't even think about it anymore and here's this person that's forcing you to think about it and do it in a different way than you're used to and that can be a very profound experience especially for those exploring power exchange as I have said but moving on we have one more on the list here and that would be branding and tattooing and I think this is a fitting one to end on because it's probably the most extreme out of anything on this list it's also probably the most rare thing that you will come across in the community like it's very popular in fan fiction and erotica and fantasies, but not very many people do it in real life. And I think for people that are very against it or are disgusted by it, I think for people that find it very taboo to the point where they don't even want to think about engaging in it, it's because honestly, I think a lot of it is probably a sense of like cringe and embarrassment. Like it's cringy to get a barcode tattoo on your thigh because your master owns you in the same way that it would be cringy to get like a tramp stamp of your partner's name on your backside or to get your partner's name tattooed on your throat like people are like oh that's like kind of gross and kind of weird and cringy like why would you go that far and you know there are people who do things like get barcode tattoos or their partner's initial on them somewhere because they do believe that power exchange is more lasting than a vanilla relationship is like how much the data bears that out as questionable. I believe currently what we know is that like power exchange relationships tend to last about as long as vanilla ones do, but a lot of people do have the mentality that with power exchange, you know, you're serving somebody forever throughout all of time and beyond death into the next life. And like people make very big promises with their power exchange relationships and naturally they want to express that on their body somewhere as a permanent sign of commitment and though it can be seen as too extreme by some other people either because of the fact that they're like kind of like it's sort of cringy and weird to do like what if somebody asks you about it when you're on the beach like what do you tell them like that's one level of it but also because it feels like now that's very real and it's like it's inescapable it's hard to get rid of especially with branding tattooing we have laser tattoo removal it's not always a guarantee it'll fully get rid of it but you can at least usually do a cover-up of it whereas scarring and branding you're usually not getting rid of that like that that's with you for life and the idea of making that level of commitment is too much for a lot of people i think rightly so in most cases but for people that are really into it it is a way of being able to make a permanent commitment. Maybe they can't wear a collar. Maybe they don't want to wear a ring or jewelry. Maybe they prefer something that is totally indelible. They like that feeling emotionally of being able to say, I am truly 100% yours indelibly in a way that I can never ever get rid of. And for some people, that's totally their kink. They would never ever want to change it. In the same way a lot of people are very much into like, body modification or transformation where they want to go through like plastic surgery to be more appealing to their dominant partner. I think this is sort of maybe one manifestation of a similar mentality as that, at least in some cases. Again, for other people, it's maybe more practical or maybe like a tattoo, especially for somebody who's like already pretty heavily tattooed, you know, a little A here underneath your existing tattoos is not really going to be super noticeable. Whereas if it's the only tattoo that you have and you have like a huge barcode on your shoulder, like that's probably going to raise some more questions. But a lot of people do enjoy it because it goes with their aesthetic more. Or they maybe have, uh, is it Pete Davidson? Like, <laughs> like, I guess he just sort of, and possibly also because he's very wealthy and can easily afford the massive amount of laser tattoo removal necessary to do this has more of like a flippant mentality with tattoos where he's like okay getting someone's like very serious and then removing it later if he needs to and like some people are just sort of like it's my body i don't care i want to do what i want with it it's a canvas i also know lots of people that are into things with blood play that can leave scarring as well where they have that mentality where like my body is an experiment and if it doesn't work out like that's fine because it's my body 
I don't really care that much. Like I had fun with it. That's what really matters. And for some people, they also treat their body modifications with tattoos and brandings in a similar fashion. But if you are somebody who maybe wants to explore tattooing as an option, but you don't really want to go the whole way, you want to see how it feels for a scene or just for your relationship, I think you can easily do that with temporary tattoos. I think those are easily found online now. I haven't looked into this, but I imagine these days you can get customizable temporary tattoos you can wear for like a day or a week. Body writing is another good way to explore this concept, this idea. I know also other people that use hypnosis as a way to trick their partner's brain essentially into thinking they are branded, tattooed, whatever else without actually really doing it for real. So there are many options to get to that feeling without actually really having to do it. And it is a good way to step into that headspace, that mentality, even if just for a period of time while you're considering whether or not this is something that you want to actually have in your life more permanently beyond just a temporary tattoo over the weekend. And also I wanna point this out, you don't have to get a big showy barcode tattoo. I think initially if somebody says, oh, I'm gonna get a tattoo for my partner as my dominant to show that they're my dom or ma my master or whatever, a lot of people think, oh my God, they're gonna get this whole big thing and ah, it's gonna be very invasive. You can get a tiny little tattoo, you can get a little micro tattoo and get it like behind your ear, like somewhere like super discreet where no one else would ever see it. That would easily be able to be covered up if you didn't want it anymore, or something happened to the relationship. Like you don't have to get a big honking thing to have a tattoo for your partner, you know? So like you can be subtle as well. It's not like a one size fits all scenario. So keep that in mind too. It's not always as extreme as people make it out to be, which is true for so many of these kinks. Like needle play doesn't have to be being turned into a human harp. You can also get like one little needle just to try it and then like never do it again if you don't want to. But I think really what I want to emphasize here and talk about is like how much this list varies compared to what we usually do in the community and also what kinks we know to be risky and like how much our mental perception of these kinks influence our attitude about them. I think for many of these kinks, a lot of the reason why we don't like them or are turned off by them is we think they're too dangerous, right? Like blood play, that's way too dangerous. Electric play, that's way too dangerous. But like, you know, we don't usually think twice before doing bondage or doing rough body play or anything like that. We just kind of do it, but those are pretty dang risky and are also fairly routine in the community. I know infinitely more people that have been damaged by bondage gone wrong, even, you know, it could be shibari, handcuffs, whatever, than people I know that have been damaged by blood play or electro play. It does happen sometimes, but it's maybe not as common of a risk as some people make it out to be or assume it to be. Or even kinks that are totally mental, right? Like 24 seven total power exchange. Total power exchange can go very, very wrong, very easily in a way that mentally affects people for a long time. Way more than just like not enjoying a needle one time would be for most people. So I think that really just shows how mental of an experience BDSM can be for a lot of people. That it's not only just about the physical sensations, but also about how mentally we relate to certain kinks, how we frame them mentally, and how we have the power to shift our mental perception towards certain kinks. We want to have a more positive relationship with certain kinks. We can cognitively reframe how we think about them. And maybe that will allow us to open the door into exploring more kinks that otherwise we wouldn't really have anything to do with. But with that being said, there's everything I have to say in this video about different taboo and edgy kinks. There are so many other kinks I couldn't get to in this video, like hypnosis and different types of role play and diapers. And if you guys wanna see a part two to this video, 
please let me know. We'd love to make one. If you guys have any other thoughts you want to share, you can do so in a comment down below. If you enjoyed this, if you're not already, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. Link to that will be down below. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.